for cheesecake. Everybody, going once. Let's get started. I have 12:30, so I'm going to honor everyone's time as usual. Welcome. <clears throat> this is especially if this is your first time with us or your first time watching us on camera. Um, we're glad to have you here. We're going through Leviticus, the book that nobody reads. And that's the reason that we're going through it, is because it is a book that almost nobody reads, especially in churches. It's very rare to hear sermons preached from Leviticus, especially from the first five chapters. And so that's where we are this week. We're going through um, to catch, to, to always put everything in the big context, Israel. So way back, Genesis, God promised Abraham's offspring, Abraham's descendants, that through them, he would bless the entire world. Then but they went into Egypt to avoid a famine, and during the time of Egypt, they were oppressed and enslaved for 400 years. So 400 years of silence between Genesis and Exodus. Then when Exodus begins, the family of Israel has turned into the people of Israel, the 12 tribes, a nation, a huge uh, number of people. And God brings them through all the miraculous deeds we saw in the Exodus last year. God brings them out of Egypt and he brings them out into the desert, out into Midian, which is where Moses kind of grew up uh, after, his, after leaving Egypt, where he kind of, I say grew up, he was 40 until he was 80, uh, spent his middle age years, and takes him to Midian. And in Midian, there's a mountain there called Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai. It's where the burning bush appeared, that's where God appeared to Moses and said, basically, I'm gonna bring my people out of Egypt into this wilderness here, and this is where you're going to come back and you're going to worship me here. And then I'm going to send you into the land that your ancestors came from that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So Israel comes out of Egypt and they get back to Mount Sinai, which is where all of this is taking place. Everything after Exodus 19 is right there at Mount Sinai. And it won't move again until the book of Numbers, halfway through Numbers. So... They're at Mount Sinai, camped around the base of it. Moses goes up on the mountain. He makes the covenant with God. The covenant is God entering into a binding agreement now with the offspring of Abraham who have become a nation. They're no longer a family, they're a nation. And he enters into a covenant with them that's basically, here's how you're going to be my people in this land that I'm sending you to. Here's how you're going to act in order to continue to fulfill this promise that I made to Abraham. So in order to fulfill that promise to Abraham, you have to be a nation, and you have to be a nation in covenant with me. You have to be a nation in relationship with me. You live according to the laws that I'm giving instead of according to the mandates that Pharaoh gave. You serve me rather than serving Pharaoh. And if you do this, unlike Pharaoh, I won't enslave you or treat you harshly. Rather, I'll bless you, prosper you, protect you, send you crops, send you abundance. And the world will see that through me, in this relationship, that, that, that I am the one true God. That everyone, that, that sin has distorted and marred this relationship that should be enjoyed by everyone on earth. So this is all of the big picture plan what God's doing. So then he brings them, they're at Mount Sinai. Moses comes down. There's a whole incident where they actually break the contract. They, they rip up the covenant, so to speak, by doing the golden calf incident. And there's a period in Exodus where you're not sure if God's going to wipe them out and start over with Moses like he said. Because remember, God's promises are never limited by a people's ethnicity or by a people's demands or by a people's presumption of their rights. God's promises are, can be kept in a myriad ways. And so God tells Israel, basically, uh, they, they demonstrate repentance and he says, I, I'm, I'm reinstalling the covenant. I'm reinstating the covenant. We're going to sign the contract again. Moses gets a second uh, stone tablets, the second Ten Commandments and, and the Covenant, all the stuff that goes along with it. And the people agree to it, and then they build the tabernacle, they build this worship space, because God says, I don't want to keep you here at Mount Sinai, where I'm up on the mountain, and you're separated from me by degrees of holiness, so only some of the people can come to the foot of the mountain, then only a few can come halfway up the mountain, then only like Moses, Aaron, and Joshua can come to the top of the mountain, and then only Moses can come to the very top of the mountain, where God's glory cloud has enveloped. God says, I want to take that object lesson and I want, to I want you to take it with you wherever you go. So what you're going to do is you're going to build a mini Mount Sinai. And this is how you're going to build it. 
And so he gives them the directions for this thing called the tabernacle. The tabernacle is just a fancy word. It means dwelling or tent. He gives them the instructions for how to build a tent. Because he's going to be a mobile God. He's going to be a God that goes with his people in their midst, in the middle of them. Literally, they will be encamped around the tent. And uh, so he gives them these instructions. And then the book of Exodus ends with uh, like eight chapters or seven chapters of them building that thing. That little mini Mount Sinai that in many ways, you know, is symbolic of everything that Mount Sinai was. And if you missed all that, check the podcast or check the YouTube videos. You can see how it all plays out. But then at the very, very, very end, last chapter of Exodus, then he, he, uh, the tabernacle is built, everything's ready, and the glory of God falls, and it moves from the top of Mount Sinai into the center of this thing, the tabernacle. And it's so thick and it's so heavy that Moses, even Moses, can't enter. God has entered into his tent. God has set up camp. He's dwelled among his people. And then Leviticus, as we saw the first week in this study, is right up. From that event, there's no break between Exodus 40 and Leviticus 1. There's no 400-year period. There's not even a grammatical break. Leviticus 1 begins with the word and because it follows right on the heel of Exodus 40. So God immediately, as soon as he enters his dwelling place, then he says, now, here's how you're going to use this thing. Here's how you're going to approach me. Here's how we're going to relate. And so for the first seven chapters of Leviticus, he's giving them the instructions for usage of this system, the tabernacle, and the priesthood, Aaron's sons that he's consecrated to serve him in the tabernacle because of their faithfulness at the Golden Calf Incident. And, and he's, he's saying, here's, here's the owner's manual. Here's how it's going to work. And the first three offerings, we're going to look at the third one today, but chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 1 was the whole bird offering. It was the basis of all of them. It was the one that basically communicated to people, everything you own, everything you produce, everything that you bring forth ultimately belongs to me anyway. And so you're going to commemorate our presence with one another by giving me, completely giving to me your best of the, and then he, the, he makes three categories, the herds, the flocks, or the birds, if you can't afford any of those three. These are an agricultural people, an agrarian people, a, a shepherding people. So their money, their primary form of currency was livestock, was animals. So this is a way of giving to God their very best. So the whole burnt offering, and it was completely burned. None of it was eaten. None of it was, was, was consumed by the people or the priest. It was entirely given to God. Then chapter 2, the second offering was the grain offering, or the cereal offering, or the rabbis called it the <laughs> offering for people too poor to even give the bird uh, of the first offering. So it was sort of continuing that theme of you're going to get, we're also going to celebrate a meal together. And at a meal, there is not just meat, but there's also meat and usually bread of some type in the ancient Near East. So you're going to give a pinch or a handful of your best grain. And then again, three types. So just like the first one, there are three types of whole burnt offering. There's three types of uh, grain offerings. So there will be fine, what we would call fine flour, or the choicest flour, or you could give it in cooked, baked form. Um, and there was ways that if you baked it, you had to do it this way, this way, and this way. Or you could give um, another type of grain, barley, and you could offer that as well. So there are, again, three different ways to do it. So within each of these sacrifices, each of these offerings, there, there are degrees or variations depending on where what people are able to give. And then this third one today that we come to is, depending on your translations, if you have NIV, it's um, the fellowship offering, I think. Uh, New Revised and, and NASB and King James and others will have different names for it. But the Hebrew name for it, since that's what we're studying the Hebrew text, um, it's literally the offering of peace, or the peace offering. Uh, uh, Zabak Shalomim, the offering of peace, or, or, or the offering of Shalom. And this offering is going to be the final of these first three that were completely voluntary. I don't know if you've caught this before, but up until now, these first two offerings and this one, none of these are required. None of these are, you will bring this and this and this. It is, if someone brings this and this and this, then this is how they should do it. All of the first three offerings that the book of Leviticus begins with were voluntary. God doesn't begin where we would begin by saying, all right, first let's clear up your sin. So bring me the sin offering. Bring me the reparation offering. Now then we can get on to the celebration. 
He actually does it the opposite way in Leviticus. The first thing God says to Israel out of the tenor of this tabernacle, when his glory cloud falls and he speaks to the people, the first thing he tells them is, we're going to celebrate. We're going, you're going, this is how you're going to relate when you bring me these types of offerings. And they're all voluntary. They're all offerings that are given out of a heart of gratitude and a desire for fellowship. That's why the NIV translates this as fellowship offering, because it demonstrates the peace, the shalom, that exists between the worshiper, the priest, and God. And in, in also what it represents, uh, sometimes it's called the offering of well-being by some translations, because that shalom doesn't just mean peace as in we're not fighting anymore. Shalom means peace as in wholeness, well-being, um, every, things being the way they should be. And so uh, other commentators have looked at this and said, yes, it's the offering of well-being because this is the offering by which people would primarily feed their families the meat from this thing. This, this is when they get together and have a communal meal. This would be their Thanksgiving dinner. No turkey. It would be lamb or it would be cow or it would be goat. So this is, this is the, the family meal or the family get together. And on the occasions that it was done, it, it, there's many occasions that it could be offered. These, these aren't like one time only sacrifices. And some of them are daily. The whole burnt offering, you know, that would happen daily. And uh, some of them are periodically at certain festivals. And then others are just whenever you wanted to celebrate. So Leviticus 7, when we get to that, it'll sort of recap and it'll say, this is how you do these offerings that we've talked about. And it will give examples of when you do this offering, when you offer one of these uh, peace offerings. And it would be either in uh, uh, just to show thanksgiving to God. It would be uh, as a free will, like you just decide, you just, I want to freely worship and I want to celebrate with my family and my clan or whoever our relationship with God as his people. Or it would be if you've successfully or, uh, completed a vow. If you made a vow to the Lord and you can, or to somebody else, you completed it, and you want to celebrate that. So, so the tone of this offering is celebratory from, from start to finish. And so this is what we read, chapter 3. It says, if someone's offering is a fellowship or peace offering, and he offers an animal from the herd, whether male or female, so this is cattle, herd is usually cattle, he's to present before the Lord an animal without defect. He's to lay his hand on the head of this offering and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Remember, the offerer, the one doing it, bringing it, does the killing. That's something that a lot of us never realized. I didn't until I started studying with Because I always thought it was the priest's job to kill. But it wasn't. It was the offerer. If you bring the animal, you kill the animal. The priest's job is to then take it from there after the animal has been uh, killed and prepared. Uh, he is to lay his hand on the head of the offering and slaughter it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, priests, shall sprinkle the blood against the altar on all sides. From the fellowship offering, he is to bring a sacrifice made to the Lord by fire. And this is what it is. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. This, this is, and this translates different ways in different translations, but... The fat quote that this is talking about, um, I think it's the it's hello. I think it's hello. Uh, yeah, hello is the word for fat, and it doesn't mean fat like you know every cut of meat. I mean, there's fat in this meat that we just ate today. There's, there's traces of fat throughout. It's not talking about that. It's talking about that layer of fat. I think it's called the suet uh, in, in agricultural terms. I don't know. I haven't slaughtered many animals recently, <laughs> but there's layers of fat that cover some of the organs that are like a membrane. And then there's like a, a little piece of fat that's very specific to the, that's around the liver. And then, so it's not talking about just in general all fat. It's just talking about these, this stuff. And this stuff, this fat, was considered or symbolic in the ancient Near East as the best part, the choicest part. You know, we're in the, the dieting society, so we think of fat as the worst part of something. But in the ancient Near East, their problem wasn't being overweight. Uh, their problem was eating day to day. The fat was the best part. The fat gave them the calories they needed to live in an ancient world where there was, you know, no processed food, no TV, no vehicles. You know, they, if you ever are a survivalist, you know, watch those survival shows, they'll eat any fat that they can find. You know, they'll eat bugs and worms that have a lot of fat in them because it's the calories, it's the, 
It's the energy that they need. So there, in, in, in those terms, when we put ourselves back in the mindset of the ancient Near East, these types of fats and these organs that God's talking about, kidneys and the liver, those are the choice parts. Those are the best parts. Those are the most life-giving parts. And that's the key is the life-giving part is what God says you're going to remove that. That's what you're going to remove and you're going to put that on the altar. That's what's going to be dedicated to me for this offering. So it says, then Aaron's sons are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering. That's the first offering we did. That's on the wood, on the burning wood. As an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Verse 6, if he offers an animal from the flock, so not, that was for cattle, this would be for sheep. If he offers an animal from the flock as a fellowship offering to the Lord, he's to offer a male or female without defect. If he offers a lamb, he's to present it before the Lord. He's to lay his head on the head of the offering and slaughter it in front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. From the fellowship offering, he's to bring a sacrifice made to the Lord by fire. And here's what it is. It's fat. The entire fat tail cut close to the backbone. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connecting to them. Both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food as food an offering made to the Lord by fire. So this is if they bring sheep. Now, there's, I always thought it was funny when it says, and bring the fat tail. Because I just think that's a funny term, fat tail. But literally, these are, these, this, this, the type of sheep that were being offered are called broad tail sheep. And they are still raised over in Israel. And, um, and the tail of these sheep is huge. Like, it's not, we don't have these in North American sheep that I know of. But the tail weighs between 15 and 50 pounds. Like, that's a lot. Of, that's a fat tail. <laughs> and that's the best part. And it's considered in, in I, I believe in some Arab cultures, it's considered, again, a delicacy part or, or a choice part. So, again, that part given to God, the choices, the delicacy part, burned up on the altar. And then the rest is given back to the priest and to the offerer. Uh, third section, if his offering is a goat, he is to present it before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on his head and slaughter in front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. From what he offers, he is to make this offering to, fire, to the Lord by fire. All the fat that covers the inner parts are is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them all on the altar as food, an offering made by fire, a squeezing aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Wherever you live, you must not eat any fat or any blood. So he's setting up now this sacrifice. This offering is going to be for celebration. It's going to be for joyous occasion. It's going to be their Thanksgiving dinner. And the best part will go to the Lord. The fat part will go to the Lord. And the people aren't to eat of that. That's, he's, he's basically putting this condition. You're not going to eat these, which, which other cultures may have eaten. Other cultures did eat. Uh, but you, as my people, are going to be different. You're not going to eat this fat, and you're not going to eat blood. Those are the two things that you are not going to eat. Whenever you kill something, you're going to drain its blood. You're going to remove its fat. And you're going to offer those. You're going to sprinkle them on the altar. You're going to offer them in fire on the altar. And what that's symbolizing, one of the things that's symbolizing, is these elements that are seen as the choicest and the most life-giving, the most prized, are given back to God as recognition that he gives everything to begin with. Anything that, that connotes uh, life, vitality, health, goodness. And that's what, again, we're not in that age where we think that, of that, where we think of fat. You know, we think of fat, we think of lazy and, and bad for you and heart attacks and all of that. But they thought of fat as the good. In fact, they thought of fat as the good part because there's a metaphor in the Hebrew Bible. Sometimes the, the wording later will be used as bring me the fat of the land. So that's his metaphor for saying the, the best parts. And he's not meaning that there's, you know, big blobs of fat laying around. He's talking about the best grains, the best crops, the best, you know. So... What God's saying in this section, he's prohibiting Israel. He says, you're not going to eat blood. And all the way back to Genesis 9, where blood was connected intimately with life. We, you know, we think of blood as connected with death. But in, in, in Scripture, it, it was only secondarily connected with death. Its primary meaning was life. And that's why it was prohibited from being eaten or consumed 
as, as part of a meal and, and certainly as any ritual as other pagans would have used it for. Rather, it was sprinkled on the altar, the altar that symbolized that place where God received from humanity their gifts to him in the form of being burned and the smoke ascending. That's all the symbolism. That's all of the word picture that's going on is when you put something on the altar that you that you that you've slaughtered, that you've cut up, that you've divided, that you've processed yourself and you put it on the altar and the priest sprinkles its blood. So so the fat and the blood, all the life of this thing is on the altar and then it's burned up with fire and the smoke rises and that's described multiple times as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. God loves the smell of a good barbecue. And because it symbolizes the celebration that his people are, are enacting, right? It symbolizes the, the joy and the fellowship. Listen, this is how in the ancient Near East, this is how you got your meat. You know, for some people, especially if you're a vegetarian, this is kind of squeamish. If you're a vegetarian, I'm, I'm thankful that you're in a Roots Chris steakhouse, uh, that you cross that threshold. But in, in scripture, this is how they would get their steak. This is how they would get their meat. And it would be, most of it would come through, if not all of it. Some commentators argue that all meat had to be uh, prepared or slaughtered in, in such a way. But regardless of whether that's true or not, taking an animal's life was accompanied by, e even if it was just in the mind of, I'm giving this back to the Lord, or a portion of this back to the Lord, or I'm showing my thankfulness to God for providing this food for me and for my family and for my friends. And we've, we've separated that. And I joke about this being a steakhouse, but then you watch how some of this meat may have been processed, and it's pretty far from godly. Um, it, it's something that we've got to find that balance as a culture if we want to capture the, the, the spirit of how God intended, at least in this age, uh, stewardship of creation and ethical consumption of meat and all that. It's a whole different thesis argument you could get into. But the point is that it should inform how we're looking at Everything from the most lofty of spiritual things, whether we're singing worship songs in church with our hands raised, to the most mundane things like eating a meal here around the table together. All of it in the life of Israel was to be part of showing thanksgiving that they are in a right relationship with God. None of these offerings that they do in Leviticus are ever to achieve God's favor. So I, I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this horse to death, speaking of slaughtering animals. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, continue on this theme that they never, never, never offered a sacrifice to earn God's favor or to earn God's love. Never. That is a figment of Martin Luther's imagination. Jews did not do that. They offered these things because they had already been shown God's favor and were already in a relationship with him. So they offered these offerings, and even the ones that we'll see in the next two that are going to come that were not voluntary, that had to be done whenever sin entered the picture, they were all done with the mindset of we're doing this not to become God's people. We're doing this because we are God's people. And this is our response to being God's people. We, our response to being in shalom, in peace with God and with one another, is to offer this celebratory sacrifice to celebrate together the state that we enjoy, this, this state of being that we live in. So when we get together to have a meal, something very holy is taking place. Unlike the other nations where a meal is just a time for just you know, wanton debauchery, or a time for gluttony, or gorging yourself, or a time for you know, eating and consuming what you have and leaving the poor out of it. Uh, you know, unlike all of those other ways in Scripture, the meal was was put there as as a time of, of gathering together and celebrating or enjoying the peace that we have because of this whole covenant thing that we're a part of. So because we're God's people, in covenant with God, we give a portion of this offering to God, the, the best part. We offer that up to God as sort of his part of the meal because he's eating with us. Even though he didn't, he's not seen as technically consuming or eating the food, the aroma rising up to him, the fact that it's being set up as a symbolic way of saying God is eating with us. We've set a place for him at the table 
Or rather, it should be, he set a place for us at his table. So we're going to eat together with God, and the priest is going to be provided for. He doesn't have flocks, he doesn't have herds, he doesn't have lands. He is God's butler. He is God's houseman or housemaid or whatever you want to call. He's the one that serves in God's tent. So we're going to give the best to God. We're going to give a portion to the priest and his family. And then the rest of the animal, we and our family and friends eat together. And if it was a whole animal, because it says an animal from the herd, a family can't eat a cow. That's going to be a bigger celebration. It's going to be a bigger time for community. It's, if it were an offering of a cow, then usually more than just one little family would be part of it. It would be a communal thing. It would be a celebratory thing. So all of this is sort of wrapped up in how Israel eats, how they do Thanksgiving dinner. And they don't just do it once a year. They do it on whenever they feel thankful, whenever they feel like giving God thanks or bringing him an offering. There's, in the New Testament, Jesus sort of takes all of these sacrifices, and, and so if the sacrifices, if these first five sacrifices are like five threads, think of like a, 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 a loom or a weaving or a strands, you've got these five threads that, that Leviticus talks about as these separate offerings. In the New Testament, Jesus kind of takes them and weaves them together into one cord that, that is himself. So he reflects all of these types of offerings that we've done. He gives himself fully. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, the New Testament flat out says, he is our peace offering. So he's, he's subsuming and fulfilling all of these sacrifices. So whenever we're reading this, we're reading as Christians who believe in Jesus, believe in him as Messiah and his death on the cross and his resurrection, we have to add this additional layer, other than the historic understanding that Hebrews had, we add in the layer of this also tells us something about the type of, of sacrifice that Jesus was. This gives us one of the angles of what he came to do. And, and so the New Testament, if you want examples, if you're a Bible write down, writer downer, uh, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Flat out says this, that Jesus, this is our peace offering. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus made the two one in himself by initiating peace that did not exist before then between people and God and between people and others. And then Ephesians 5, 2 as well. Um, so Jesus is this peace offering par excellence. He's the ultimate reality that this Levitical shadow was pointing towards. But in order to see the reality, we have to understand the shadow. Then it makes more sense. Then we start to see why Jesus would use images like, I am the bread of life. Or what John the Baptist would say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins. Um, why Jesus would do things like on the night that's going to commemorate his entire mission being accomplished, what did he celebrate it with? A meal. A Passover meal. What did he do? He broke bread. He shared the wine. They ate of the Passover lamb. So all of the symbolism is swirling around in the New Testament. And if we read and are familiar with the Old Testament and the books that we don't ever read or study, like Leviticus, then actually then when we go to the New Testament and read it, it gives us a deeper appreciation and more of an understanding of what's going on there. Next week we're going to look at the first sacrifice that is not voluntary. Um, this is going to be the so-called sin offering. And we'll see in the Old Testament, and, and we'll, chapters uh, five, four, 4, 5, and 6 kind of blur together. So it, we'll, we may not go distinct chapter by chapter each time. That's okay, because like we always say, chapters weren't added until the Middle Ages. So the original text was just all one thing. But um, as you're reading Leviticus, and hopefully you're not just reading it when you get here, <laughs> or as we go through it, but you're actually reading it during the week, multiple times or listening to it while you drive on audio version or, or something like that you're taking in the sensory uh, aspect of it you're imagining you're envisioning it think of the temple when you think of the tabernacle think of it as as much a slaughterhouse and a cook's kitchen as it is a holy worship place because it was both of those you know, the priests are covered in white linen and, and, and shiny uh, stones and gleaming gold and also a lot of blood. I mean, it, it all mixes together in the life of Israel. 
when you start to see, I'll end with this, when you start to see about rituals, there's a quote by um, Samuel Ballantyne in his Leviticus commentary that I've been looking at. He says, priestly rituals are a social drama that both symbolize and enact belief. So it's this social drama, it's this, it's this dramatic presentation, what the priests do, that's meant to be seen publicly, that symbolizes what the people believe and what this whole covenant thing is, but it also in some way enacts those beliefs, like in a tangible way. It says um, this, this, the ritual, priestly ritual, and all of the stuff that Luke talks about, it says it turns the cognitive recognition into a tangible, concrete act. And it's like why, you know, when you go celebrate communion, at church, there's this, even if it's however you do it, dipping the bread or getting the thing put on your tongue by the priest or however you do communion, it's a concrete act. It's, it's tangible. It's something you can touch and taste and smell and feel. And it symbolizes beliefs and, and theology and all this stuff. But it also is a way of actually participating in those beliefs in a concrete way. So it meets and it, and it conforms uh, or confronts all of our senses. And that's something that, especially if we come from Protestant low church tradition, like more loose, like more, you know, just casual, as opposed to like Episcopalian or Catholic where it's very high church, sometimes we miss out on the good stuff about the high church, which is the sights and the smells and the liturgy and the repetition. That can become dead, it can become lifeless, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and so as somebody, and I'm in the tradition of kind of loose casual, so it's, it's good to look back and to see and to appreciate that tangible ritual aspect uh, for what it truly is. One minute over, so go back to work, go back home. We've got seconds here if you want some, and have a great week. See you next week.